Alright, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and very good morning to everybody. Um, welcome to the breakfast at UMH and today is Wednesday, uh, 8th of December and we are going to talk about um, pediatric craniofacial team and today with me we have um, almost three quarter of our big family and um, let me introduce you with our uh, speakers um, from the... Um... Hello. Hello, everyone. Morning. Yeah. Right, that's Prof. Tong. That's Prof. Tong, our pediatric um, genetics team is um, associate Professor Gan, who Hi. is our uh, uh, pediatric intensivist um, specialist. And followed by Associate Professor JNT, who is our pediatrics um, ENT specialist. And here on my right is Associate Professor um, Prof. Pridaus Hariri. Assalamualaikum. Morning. Prof. Chu. Um, good morning. Uh, from uh, ophthalmology and um, Dr. Tan Weekend, our pediatric new anesthesia. Good morning, all the viewers. Um, to all viewers, we apologize because our internet connection from the billet faculty is quite bad. And I just hang on for a while, let us uh, sort out the um, the technical issue glitch maybe everybody is try to log in and try to register their attendance today at this hour so probably that explained why the internet connection is a bit poor just hang on um with us for a while and um earlier this morning i received a message uh from the president of alumni medical society and um she um, Prof. Aizura, who uh, sent a message to me to share with all of you to, to, to share a minute of silence to remember the passing of um, Dr. Dr. Tan Kai Cha, one of our uh, first um, UM alumni who graduated in 1978, who passed away um, a couple of days ago. Um, and he was a prominent uh, liver surgeon who works in Malaysia, Singapore, and many other countries. And I think um, we should um, pay our last respect and um, think about the good memories that you, we have with him. And let's go for a, a minute silence. Okay. Um, right. Let's, um, let's start with this session. And um, today's session is um, is going to be a mix of um, um, presentation, case discussion, and uh, it is divided into four parts of uh, discussion where we will bring all of you in with us into a journey of a patient who um, will be seen in the clinic. So you will have the idea of how the craniofacial team works when we presented a case in the clinic, we give an idea. And then uh, on the second part, we'll bring you to the pediatric ICU care, where we discuss uh, pre-operatively um, how we're gonna um, tackle the case. And we will share with you several images, videos that we have uh, intraoperatively. And subsequently, we will discuss about the future of craniofacial team that we think will benefit both the Faculty of Medicine as well as UC Malaya Medical Center as, and in to, to the whole Malaysia in, uh, in general. All right, so just to get everybody on board that um, pediatric um, craniofacial team is bigger than what we have here on this table. Um, we have um, uh, pediatrics ophthalmology, ENTs, intensive care, um, neuroanesthesia, uh, pediatric genetics, respiratory, pediatric gastro, and 
um, when we talk about maxillofacial surgery, it's not about maxillo. And um, uh, as I said, maxillofacial surgery, even though there's one um, square here, but it's actually um, a lot of other subunit from maxillofacial, like pediatrics, orthodontics, and many more. So before we start, I would like to uh, share with you our family tree and pay tribute to the first generation of pediatrics um, craniofacial team. As you see there, um, it started about um, in 2008 with Prof. Damendra, uh, Prof. Datu Zainal from um, Bentel, Prof. Lucy Chan, Prof. Lucy Lam, Prof. Chu, who is still with us here, Prof. Noliza, Prof. Tong, and Prof. Anna. So, so now we are in our second generation um, with me, um, taking over from Prof. Damendra and uh, Fridaus here, our partner from, and he's taking over from dentistry. We have uh, Dr. Jayant, uh, Prof. Jayanti, Prof. Gan, Prof. Tan Wei Kiang, Dr. Ag, Dr. Te Sukun, Dr. Jayanti, Fazliana, Wan Aizad, and Dr. Justin. So we have the bigger team now, and I think there's an opportunity for us to develop and nurture the third generation, and that is what most exciting about uh, today's um, talk at the end of this. So that we are um, we are thinking forward of um, nurturing our third generation. Okay, so um, I would like to pay tribute to those who um, who. Uh, professors who have retired and created this um, uh, team and we thank you Prof. Ratu Zainal, Prof. Lucy Chan and Prof. Lucy Lam who, um, who, who spearhead this and we are here to continue this journey and we hope the next generation will follow with us. And um, shall we start with the case presentation? Okay, so, so this is the usual um, scenario that we're going to have in the clinic. Um, can I ask my speaker, can I make a big um, screen of everybody in the um, room? But can they hear me? <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, let's start with the case presentation. Um, I will sh share with you about a case, a six-month-old girl who presented with enlarging head, um, big airway obstruction, uh, with an airway obstruction, poor weight gain, and bulging eyes. So um, to medical students, to the um, trainees, house officers, medical officers, um, this is the cases that you are, you won't be seeing in the clinic in the first uh, uh, instance, they will immediately refer this case to your specialist upon um, uh, delivery. So, I uh, just want to highlight to you that when you uh, look at this child, you obviously see the head is large with veins uh, on the scalp is engorging, the eyes is bulging out from the out from the eye socket and you can see the depression in the, in the nasal bridge. So um, I think, um, shall I pass this to Prof Tong to describe the craniofacial prof? Thank you, Faisal. So good morning. So at the first outset, uh, it is very important to note that, uh, you know, a baby should be examined at birth, right? So uh, very often this is missed and consequently you get a child coming to the clinic very a bit late uh, with all these uh, what we call as dysmorphic features. Yeah, So as you can see from the slide shown by uh, Prof. Aizal, you can see that the child has uh, bulging eyes which is a proptosis, uh, a very uh, 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 retroverted uh, nose right, uh, and that would contribute to some airway compromise. You can see that he's got a uh, turicephaly of a tall forehead and that's probably due to some of the sutures uh, that had uh, prematurely closed uh, while the rest of the sutures are still on their own pace. Uh, and of course, you can see that the child um, 
might have some slow development. So a developmental assessment uh, will be very important in this child um, because that would give us a baseline of his uh, performance. And measuring of head circumference is uh, uh, mandatory and you'll find that uh, very often the head circumference are small for age. Uh, all this will add up uh, and very often we also do an examination of the rest of the body. For example, we listen to the heart for cardiac murmurs and in particular, we look at the hands and feet. The hands and feet are very important in uh, children with suspect they have cranial synostosis because uh, very often you get a very severe syndactyly yeah, uh, fusion of the digits, right? Uh, and particularly a syndrome called Appert syndrome. So overall, uh, early diagnosis is very crucial. Uh, recognition of the uh, pattern of uh, dysmorphic features and in particular, uh, every child uh, should be monitored uh, for his uh, development. So that's how we approach it in the first place. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, that is a very clear answer and that is how masters of pediatrics should answer this in the exam. Just the tips. <laughs> and um, so when we see this case in the clinic, um, we have two issues here. How to solve the eye uh, bulging out, how to solve the airway and how to solve the um, um, enlarging head. So, um, in this scenario, usually we go airway, breathing, circulation. So, we need an access to airway. So, I just asked Dr. J uh, Prof. Jayanti here to describe to us the thought process. Please share my slides. Okay. So, you're just going to share my slides. So I think from an ENT aspect, there are really four areas where we have to look at. Um, just give us one second. Okay. So the four main aspects is looking at the airway, like what Prof Faisal say, ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. So airway problems. Next is feeding problems. They also can have hearing and balance problems and speech problems. So these are the four aspects that, from an ENT point of view we, when we look at these craniofacial patients. Okay, so, the, so here you can see this is the baby Sharifa. You can see that she, she has got a tracheostomy. She's got an NG tube in place. So straight away you know she has airway problems and breathing problems. Okay. Right. So, airway problems. So, we start off with the nose and nasopharynx. You know, she had nasal stenosis. Her coena, which is the right at the back of the nose, was stenosis. So, atresia. She had a small nasopharynx because you can see her nasal bridge was depressed. And they weren't able to pass an NG tube. So, how are we going to feed this baby? Okay, so straight away, we know that she's got a difficult airway and she's got feeding, she's going to have feeding issues. Her mid face, you can see, is very flattened. Uh, her mouth, you can see, she's very crowded, large tongue. Her, her jaw is small, so the tongue is going to fall backwards. So, all these are going to cause airway problems. And because of the upper airway, you know, crowding is going to cause sleep apnea as well. So the baby Sharifa, day one of life, she was born. Straight away, there was a breathing problem. Uh, they couldn't, uh, she was in respiratory distress. One, because babies depend on their nose to breathe. So she, her nose was really uh, blocked. So she couldn't breathe. So they had to put an airway into her mouth to help her breathe. And then she was transferred to us from a uh, private center. So at 19 hours of life, we had to intubate her. So in NICU, there was difficulty intubating her. So she already has a very difficult access, very anterior larynx. They tried multiple attempts and eventually they managed to intubate her. Day two of life, we had to scan her uh, brain and face to see how we're going to, to, to manage this child moving forward. Day seven of life, we attempted to widen her nose uh, 
and put an NPA in. So you can see down here, this is what an NPA is. So it's really an airway uh, to help her breathe. But the problem with these airways is it can block off very easily. So day 13 of life, NPA got blocked, had to be re-intubated. And we know that she's already a difficult intubation. So we had to plan for a tracheostomy. So eventually she had to get a tracheostomy. Breathing, sorry, the, the next is the feeding issue. So couldn't put an NG, and that's why she's got an NG in her mouth. Uh, they tend to have problems with coordination. They tend to aspirate. And that's because they have a small jaw, underdeveloped muscles, and innovation problem. OK, so unsafe to swallow, had to depend on the tube. And eventually, we had to convert it to a peg tube for feeding. So these children have problems with uh, thriving, not only because of a swallowing problem, they also have problems with breathing. So all that contributes to inability to put on weight. And they can also present with recurrent pneumonias because they aspirate very easily uh, due to, as I said, the innovation problems. Hearing. Thankfully, in baby Sharifa doesn't have a hearing problem, but we all we all children have has to be screened so we do a screening test if they fail the screening test they go on to have a full hearing assessment um, and then from there we decide whether the child needs to be aided or not so in in other children you can see here in this child you know they have a small ear with multiple tags um, and in this child you know she had a, a conductive problem uh, so in, in, in many of these children, not only do they have hearing problem, they also have outer deformities. So when they have hearing problems, they, they have a tracheostomy, all this will have uh, contribute to a speech problem. And like what Prof Tong says, they also have developmental delays and learning disability. So overall, um, this contributes to speech problems. So investigation, so I won't go into too much detail, so I'll pass it back to you, Faisal. All right, thank you. Um, Jay, we'll discuss about this uh, probably later. And usually we will ask after ENT reviews, because every then we say it, we ask Prof Chu, uh, ophthalmology team, to give us a comment on the eye, what, what should we do with the eyeball, it's just bulging and so, so we ask Prof Chu, Prof Chu, you can start talking. Let me just uh, share this slide. Um, yeah, good morning. Can you please share, share both the... This one, yeah? Uh, the one that says my... Yes. Right, so uh, optimize. Okay, thank yep. you. So I'm going to just briefly uh, give an overview of what ophthalmology does uh, for the combined clinic. Um, and um, thank you. Right. So the role of the eye doctor is really to assess for ocular complications, which is very common in this uh, group of patients. Uh, also, we need to uh, assess the optic nerve to help in contribute to decision making on when uh, the surgeons need to go in. And of, of course, after surgery, we need to uh, monitor the optic nerve function very closely. So ocular complications can be in the form of corneal ulceration, amblyopia from squints, uncorrected significant refractive errors, uh, and optic atrophy can sometimes be seen at the first examination if the children are presenting to us late. It can be due to raised intracranial pressure, poor oxygen supply to the nerve, very tight optic canal opening, and of course, presence of glaucoma. So in a very small series we had, Majority of our patients had proptosis, more than half had strabismus. So 8.3% had optic disc swelling at the time of examination, and unfortunately, about 13% already had optic atrophy. Um, so our team consists of our registrar, our junior specialist, and uh, of course, there's Prof. Noliza and myself. We take turns to do the examination. And uh, so these are the things we look at. 
These are the instruments that we need to make our evaluation. This is an indirect ophthalmoscope. Sometimes the children can sit at the slit lamp if they are cooperative, but most of the time uh, they are not so. And ideally, we want to record the uh, optic disc appearance for future comparison. So this is our $470,000 red cam. Uh, cam, red, red cam machine, which is currently out of order. But anyway, we also need lots of support staff uh, in the form of nurses, optometry, orthoptists, and our ocular technicians. So we first saw uh, our baby at two months old, and uh, these were the eye findings. Very shallow orbits, but she was able to close both eyes quite good. There was no exposure minimal uh, age-appropriate uh, hypermetropia and everything was normal and even the optic disc looked fairly normal but we did notice a little bit of uh, blurring of the nasal disc margin so these are red cam images we took right eye and left eye um, so we did manage to capture this if you use your imagination a bit it's quite uh, hazy here compared to the other eye so the child was managed conservatively. Unfortunately, at four months later, uh, there was one episode when the baby was crying a lot and the eyes uh, actually popped out of the socket. So this was very frightening for the parents. And so an emergency eye consult was made and fortunately our eye doctors were able to gently uh, reposit the eyeball back into the socket with a lot of ointments and by gently lifting the eyelids over. And uh, fortunately, there was no corneal damage and the pupillary light reflex was still uh, normal. So at this point, we actually uh, asked for early tarsography and that's when we hopped onto the uh, ENT uh, theater for our EUA, as well as to do this tarsography, which is done by our oculoplastic surgeon, Dr. Fazliana. Uh, we made it permanent. So uh, at least the eye opening is smaller. And, but what was more concerning is if you look at the optic disc now, this is very, very swollen in the left eye and the right eye already three quarters are hazy. So, um, so we actually used this staging, the Frisian uh, scale. Um, and um, what should I do this post-op? Yeah. Let's, let's, let's. Yeah. Maybe we just stop yeah. Yeah. So okay. so now the the ENT surgeon is looking at me and Fedaus. The ophthal the ophthalmologist looking at me and Fedaus says, "Please sort out the the brain <laughs> and yeah. release the intracranial pressure." So, um, so this is when the um, the decision is getting um. Difficult because baby is small, baby weight is less than seven kilo. We need to think how do we in, increase the volume because again, my anesthetist will uh, say to me, you can you can only lose several few milliliters of blood only for this baby. So the pressure, the decision is uh, difficult. So I'll ask. Uh, uh, so we have a plan. Um, Prof. Dows has a plan, so let's uh, let's see what is the plan looks like. Um, which one? Okay, let's see. Okay, let's see. Dows, just yes. carry on first. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. Uh, yes, essentially, uh, the process of getting towards a surgical procedure is not that simple. Uh, we practice uh, consensus and a lot of uh, discussions uh, before deciding on um, surgical uh, making decision. And uh, unfortunately for this baby, um, we have to go in. And when we talk about going in, we have the options of whether to do a conventional uh, surgery um, or an integrated uh, surgical procedure uh, with a tissue engineering uh, technique uh, called distraction osteogenesis. Uh, we in fact have um, a protocol which we have published, if I'm not mistaken, back in 2017. Uh, and 
what what would be the indication to decide whether a baby or a child would go for conventional or distraction really depends on the uh, goal uh, and the magnitude of surgical movement as certain conventional surgery has limitations thus exposing uh, the long-term outcome to a poor result uh, in particular relapse uh, so uh, when we go back to the case uh, the baby uh, you can have a look at the CT scans uh, basically uh, the, the high ICP the increase uh, in intracranial pressure has actually leads to the thinning of bone due to the cortical drift uh, this um, view is known as copper beaten skull you can clearly see in the CT scan the longer we wait the more um, holes actually uh, and uh, once we have decided to go in uh, it's a matter of how much do we want to expand yeah so we did a computerized simulation uh, this is uh, via an open software uh, because at this stage we know that this baby has three main issues uh, the first one is increased intracranial pressure which is not good for the brain Secondly, is on the eye, uh, and thirdly, of course, uh, for the airway. But at this very moment, the airway has been secured. Uh, so we uh, will focus more to the brain and eye function. And uh, the simulation uh, indicating more than a centimeter of expansion. So we decided to print the model. Uh, this is the protocol that I've mentioned before. We have published it uh, in 2018. So when we look at this child, uh, basically the surgical in intervention uh, was indicated for two major functions. One is the raised ICP, and secondly is for the orbital proptosis, leading to a lot of issues. So the focus would be more uh, on the frontal orbital segment, uh, and that's what we did. We did 3D models. Um, we simulate, we translated the simulations from the computer to the actual models, uh, have a de device in place on both segments. And this technology, the advancements of technology really helps in terms of a precision. Um, and then the time management, blood loss definitely. And of course, long term, long term outcome. We translate the planning on the table, this is just a picture of uh, the frontal and supraorbital rim that we fix together with resolvable plates. And that's the two distractor devices that we place uh, uh, bilaterally. We did trial activations uh, and deactivated the device back into the positions. Uh, and uh, let's see. Uh, okay, I'll talk a bit about distraction osteogenesis as compared to conventional surgery. I've mentioned about the uh, limitations of expansion uh, leading to relapse. Uh, the advantage of distraction osteogenesis uh, is, of course, uh, that the expansion theoretically would be unlimited, subjected to the size of device. Uh, but what's uh, um, nice about this technique is that it uh, also uh, expands the skin. Uh, process called neohistogenesis uh, but of course uh, it's a very expensive uh, technique and uh, would require two surgery one to fix and the other one to uh, take it out uh, i'll hand it over to professor okay so now we have a plan however we have several obstacles in before doing surgery uh, we have to deal with our pediatric uh, neuroanesthetist there's a time and then after the surgery, we have to deal with the pediatric intensive care unit. So in order for us to um, make a, a, a joint decision, we said, OK, let's bring everybody together. Let's meet in the, in the um, pediatric ICU and discuss what is our plan. So usually we'll ask Dr. Tan Vekat, what is your concern during intraoperative operation? And can we get? the ENT to come in and then the ophthalmology to come in to sort out their issue first. 
All right. Um, so the time can continue. Can I'll just share the screen. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor. So regarding this uh, uh, pre-operative management uh, or perioperative management of this child, is, uh, definitely is a challenging case for us. Uh, the child is basically at a very young age with a very uh, uh, the birth. I mean, the current weight is usually very small. So the smaller the child gets, uh, to anesthetize this type of uh, children's in uh, or cranial facial surgery is a, there's an increasing challenge. So uh, we have to look at a few aspects that I'm going to talk about in general, and then to we'll focus to the some specific points uh, related to this uh, child. Basically, as an anesthetist, we are in charge of the patient safety throughout the perioperative course. And what we usually do is before we meet, uh, before we anesthetize the patient, we have to assess the patient in thorough regarding what are the problems that actually are uh, overlies or underlies in these uh, patients. Uh, a lot of times, we have to identify whether this is a syndromic in, uh, condition or non-syndromic because there are some other many systemic manifestation might be occur in occurrence with the syndromic uh, cranial synostosis patient. Like uh, this baby Sharifa, we are suspecting it's a uh, uh, cruzons in nature. Uh, airway related issues also has to be taken take, uh, tackle in in terms of whether uh, the patient required uh, uh, does have any form of a uh, difficult airway features or in this case uh, it's more easier to handle because the airway was trapezoidized. Uh, otherwise, uh, patients with uh, OSA also increase the concern during the post operative uh, cost of management of the airway. Uh, these patients, is, uh, since it's uh, tracheostomized, usually in the operative se settings, we'll try to uh, change the trachea to a cup trachea to allow the effective ventilation. Uh, if there's any concurrent chest infections, actually makes us as an uh, extra thought about whether we want to proceed with the surgery because uh, this form of uh, infection, most, most of the time we have uh, recurrent chest infection like in baby Sharifa, where it can has a we worry of a more uh, uh, systemic or sepsis post op. Eh? The other thing is the peripheral venous access is very important for us to, to access it ideally for uh, easier of cannulations. Okay? And if any forms of a uh, uh, child is deemed uh, un or not optimized, we try to optimize the condition. And uh, usually, counseling will be given to the parents in terms of explaining the risk related during the anesthesia. And intraoperative costs, uh, when it comes to the surgery, there are definitely certain monitorings are very important. Basic monitorings are required, including with the arterial lines and also the central venous pressure line, CDC line, what I mean is. Securing the airway is uh, like what in our case, tracheostomize with a changing to a cup ETT. And also central venous catheter is usually uh, uh, required because this surgery required, uh, end up with a massive blood loss and required uh, transfusion and uh, adequate peripheral access also will be helpful in our settings. And the last thing is, uh, I mean, the one of the point that we have to take into consideration is the time management of uh, various procedures help might be needed during the surgery where we need to uh, consider uh, the sequence of uh, the team to, to come into the theater to avoid the OT congestions and also we can effectively manage our OT time. So a uh, few challenges that I would like to highlight here is during the surgery is definitely with the position and also the uh, eye, eye uh, protections. Uh, when it comes to position, if it's supine, it would be quite uh, straightforward. But when it's coming to a prone position state, we have to be extra careful with the paddings and our position of our uh, tube uh, or our airway, especially. Otherwise, the eye protection is, since the eyes is a very portals, definitely we need to give extra care to avoid any further uh, additional pressure to, toward the eyeball. And temperature control is very important in this uh, patient because the child is usually very small and they are prone for heat loss. Uh, the, thirdly, is uh, blood loss will be one of our uh, major uh, considerations in view of the distracting or also cutting natures of the uh, bone might lead to massive blood loss where we need to stand by a lot of uh, blood for transfusion. Next is talking about intracranial hypertension. A uh, child with usually some sort of situation, the brain is usually at the high ICP states. So uh, our anesthetic agents will be tailored to allow uh, uh, 
control of the cerebral blood flow. Okay, and one of the worrying worrying complications that we are we 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 are concerned is the uh, venous air embolism, where when the blood pressure when when there's a high risk of uh, this uh, complication to occur. So these are some of the pictures that we should in in shown in the theaters that the child was positioned in a prone position and the eye is well protected in such a way. Looking at there are some strategies in terms of the blood reducing the blood loss in the surgery. So what we aim to achieve is actually to reduce the uh, amount of blood loss. And uh, there are some, several techniques that we commonly use. Uh, but what we routinely use in our uh, practice is actually uh, tr uh, tranexamic acid uh, infusion. infusion. So uh, from the from during, I mean, this intraoperative cough, definitely we have to manage a few things, but definitely these several issues that we have to continue our care uh, until the post-operative period, which covers the pain management and the uh, uh, ongoing fluid resuscitation together with the sedation for post-operation. So same thing, we also will not neglect the uh, ETT and also the tracheostomy care in our patient. So infection control with prophylactic antibiotics is also one of the important components to be considered during the surgery. Okay, so now um, we have a plan, we have, we, we have listened to our anesthetists, they are concerned, uh, we have planned for the scheduling ENT to come in first and then to change the tracheostomy and then um, the ophthalmology team will come and um, have a look at the eye. We, did oper we can do the operation, not an issue. And then post-operatively, Prof. Gun have to manage the child in PITS ICU. So before we start with the case, we have to ask his concern. What is your main concern when the child comes to PITS ICU again? Okay. Uh, thank you, Pfizer. So um, for pediatric ICU side, usually is like part of a continuation from what our anesthetists have done in theater. And a lot of uh, our work is depending on surgeon as uh, uh, they have described, this is a very complex situation. And we have um, the main issue, the AOA, and this uh, particular patient, Sharifa, that uh, the AOA now is secure because of tracheostomy. Uh, and we also had learned from the past experience, if we have a tracheostomy in place, that uh, it's a lot more easier for us to manage the AOA. Uh, so uh, if you have this tracheostomy, we are quite uh, uh, happy because post-op, if the child is still sedated and require a lot of uh, pain relief, uh, pain uh, agent that we, we, we usually use is uh, IV paracetamol because it's not causing any sedative aid, uh, effect. And we would like to add on some morphine or fentanyl, it depends on uh, the case. So in this case, again, tracheostomy is there, so it's better that we add on more agent to control the pain. Some angiolytic sometimes we add, add on, like a mirazolam. And, and next, uh, the important thing, like what uh, Dr. Tan had mentioned, is the hemodynamic stability, the bleeding. So if it's been secure in operation theater, it's quite easy for us in, in ICU to manage. And of course, we continue to monitor the neural status. The race ICP now is still a problem. Sometimes we're going to monitor CSF leak, uh, and then continue to check on the pupils to make sure the child is doing okay. And in addition to that, we will coordinate, make sure our, our eye doc, uh, uh, prop shoot team will come in to check the eye. Yeah, they, they will say, I want to give steroid. So we facilitate that for, for them to come and do their eye examination. Some sedation or any cell be required. And anyway, we continue to look, uh, you know, uh, uh, look after it and make sure it's not blocked. Though it's a tracheostomy, we have to ensure the it's humidified and, and suction is done continuously. And we also will uh, send off the usual post-operative blood, ensure the coagulation profile is okay, hemoglobin is stable, not having any ongoing bleeding. And if it's, uh, some bleeding is there, we will continue to support with blood products. And uh, in terms of uh, IV drip, we usually flip restrict to about 70-80% monitor for urine output, ensure 
adequate urine output and electrolyte imbalance because the uh, at risk of uh, I mean SIDH sometimes salt wasting uh, issue will be there. And of course, um, depends on how much manipulation. It started off with um, prophylactic antibiotics and uh, it depends on you know the, the risk of infection. So in baby child trials, you got in a lung infection and pass, uh, like what Dr. Tan say, we have to look for the right timing for the surgery. Otherwise, we're going to introduce a not so common infection for, for her. So basically for ICU team side, is airway pain management and then uh, uh, wait for the recovery, facilitate all the team. I forgot to mention, maxillofacia is one of the team that come in adjusting the screw and that could cause quite a lot of pain. So our role is always ensure the child is not, you know, suffer from pain. Yeah, that's from our side. Okay, so so usually during the discussion in the pizza ICU, this is what happened. We we have we called parents to come in, we explain to them every risk, um, what are the things that are gonna involve, it's gonna be a long surgery. And this one I asked Prof Tong, let's say for example, a parent come in with a child like this, usually they'll come with in a with a question whether the next child will have this issue or not yeah that's a very important question and maybe you can just put up the slides for, for me as well so you can hear that there's a multidisciplinary team here but behind all this expertise and equipment and facilities there are two very frightened parents right always at the side uh, always concerned and worried uh, not knowing what's going to happen to their child. And this is a very important aspect that we, uh, part of the team, must uh, always look at because without a clear explanation to the parents, very often they are left in the dark and they are very worried. And very often the anxiety and even depression uh, is always, are always there. Right? And these are the unspoken fears of the parents and the family. So very often, uh, we take a family history, uh, we draw a, a, what we call a pedigree or a family tree to at least identify whether there are any risk factors in the family history that might indicate that this is a, a genetic condition. So as we heard so far uh, today, uh, cranial synostosis basically is a condition where there's premature fusion of one or more of the uh, sutures in the cranial. Okay, and normally uh, a baby's uh, fontanelles, which is the soft part of the skull, and the sutures are open to about 18 months of age. And this is a natural physiological thing to accommodate for growth of the brain, right? So you can imagine that if the sutures are closed prematurely, so obviously there will be pressure effects, and there will be pressure effects not only just on the brain, but on the nerves as well, and there will also be impact. Uh, on learning and so on. Now, generally, uh, from a pediatrician and also from a geneticist's point of view, uh, we try to identify the cause of the cranial synostosis as far as possible. And so, generally, we can divide them into primary and secondary causes. So, secondary causes are usually due to some environmental factors. For example, there are some studies that have shown that certain drugs like clomiphene uh, and so, and also some condition like thyroid disorders, may, maternal thyroid disorders may contribute uh, to cranial synostosis. But the main one that we often concerned with are the primary one. And this can be divided broadly into syndromic forms, which account for about 20%, and non-syndromic forms, which are isolated. So the overall incidence, they are quite fairly common uh, in, in the realm of uh, pediatric condition, one in 2000. Uh, generally quoted. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the presentation very often are small fontanelles, uh, narrowed sutures or what we call ridging, uh, small head circumferences and facial asymmetry. And there are also extra cranial presentation as well. Now, moving on. So this is for those who are wondering what the sutures is all about. So these are the sutures uh, that you can see. And they are basically divided into several parts uh, and uh, generally we have four sutures that we are concerned with so the frontal part of the bone we have the metopic sutures 
And across it, there's a coronal, and there's a sagittal, uh, and there's finally at the back, there's the lambdoid sutures. So these uh, sutures are controlled by many, many genes, uh, which are acting in a certain sequential manner. So they close at a certain time, and therefore, if you know that if there are changes in the genetic uh, function, obviously the switches are going to close much earlier. So cranial synostosis is a fairly heterogeneous condition. They are very mild cases, so those cases do not need surgery, but they need observation uh, to watch out for other complications. And very often for the doctors, it's a pattern recognition. And you can see from this uh, picture here, just to show you the different types of sutural synostosis that can contribute to various shape of the head that can form if they are left uh, untreated or unattended. So there are various, various uh, shapes of the head that can uh, occur uh, depending on which sutures are involved, which I'll show you a pic some pictures later on. Now, basically a quick overview on the syndromic types. So some of the most common genes that are involved nowadays are what we call fibroblast growth factor receptor genes or in short FGFR. And there are three of them, FGFR1, 2, and 3, which account for a majority that are known uh, to cause cranial synostosis. So some of these names might be new to you. So like Pfeiffer syndrome, uh, which are mainly caused by FGFR1 and FGFR2 primarily. And Appert syndrome that uh, you have seen, uh, where there is a, a severe syndactyly, they are caused primarily by FGFR2. And Cruzon, uh, in the cases that was highlighted, is also caused by FGFR2, and so on and so on, uh, and goes on. And in fact, there are more than uh, 80 genes that have been identified uh, that can cause cranial synostosis up to date uh, at the moment. Uh, and genetic forms of cranial synostosis mainly has an autosomal dominant inheritance, meaning the parents want to know, should the child grow up in the future, what's the chance of it being passed on to their offspring? And that's a 50% risk for each pregnancy. Uh, and uh, of course, up to 50% of these have de novo or spontaneous change. So they, are, they may not uh, be in the parents themselves. So very often the question is asked, is it because by one of the parents having the condition? So part of the assessment is to look at the parents and to examine them to see whether they have any features of cranial synostosis, uh, the mild ones, particularly may be missed. Uh, because obviously in their next child, if they have a parent who is having a condition, the risk of recurrence is 1 in 2 or 50% in each pregnancy. And a quick run through of different types of syndrome. So you saw Cruzon earlier on. So this is another type of uh, cranial synostosis syndrome, Pfeiffer syndrome. It can be fairly mild to quite severe, as you can see on the right side. Uh, this is the Appert syndrome. Uh, they also uh, present very early on, and you can see, uh, in particular, the hands and feet, right? They have very severe syndactyly, and this is where our orthopedic and our hand surgeons uh, come in as well. And finally, we have also the Cruzon syndrome, which I've shown, uh, and the uh, unfortunate case was the, the girl on the right, which came in very late. You can see, see here, uh, with severe proptosis uh, and so on. So, in terms of uh, managing from the genetic point of view, counselling is very important because getting the accurate diagnosis is vital and there's a communication process that takes a lot of time and uh, patience, uh, particularly in the context of parents who are very anxious. And counselling must be given before any genetic test is done, uh, mainly because uh, there are a lot of issues related to genetic results. Uh, molecular or genetic testing supports a clinical diagnosis and provide information on prognosis and reproductive decisions, as you can see. And basically, it's to assist families to make informed choices and to cope with their future challenges. So, um, I'm just going to pass it back to uh, Faisal at this point in time. Uh, but suffice to say that uh, this is a multidisciplinary team effort, uh, and very often uh, it takes a bit of uh, teamwork and a bit of a give and take. Um, as far as uh, therapeutics concern for cranial synostosis, it's coming in the pipeline, I understand. Gene editing, for example, and even uh, gene therapy, which is already available in UMMC for some condition that uh, we, we are doing here, uh, may be available very soon in the near future.
Back to you, Faisal. All right, thank you, Prof. So, um, as we can see, we, we have showcased how each um, discipline can contribute into the management of the patient. And this is quite interesting because there's a lot of research um, opportunity as well as training opportunity per se here. So, um, we, we can have a research, uh, multidisciplinary research for genetics and training there, pediatric anesthesia, um, ophthalmology, ENT, even in pediatric ICU, not to mention pediatric neurosurgery and my, comp my partner here, uh, craniofacial um, surgery, which already has uh, fellowship training for maxillofacial. Those? Want to comment on that? Uh, yes. Uh... I would like to echo what uh, Prof. Faisal has mentioned with regards to research and fellowship training. Uh, in Faculty of Dentistry, we have uh, started a fellowship program. It's more on uh, advanced uh, cranomaxillofacial surgery, focusing more to the facial and jaw regions, uh, not focusing only in pediatric craniofacial, but as well as uh, advanced orthognatic jaw corrective surgery. Um, I think we have one question to the um, doctor, to Dr. Jayanti. Uh, just now, you have a question. No. You want to answer that? Oh, you want to answer that. Uh, if that's the case, I think what I want to share with you is the last um, video of what we do um, as a team here, just to uh, close the session. Um, let's just, we'll, we'll try this first, yeah? See whether it works. So, okay, so I have a, um, I will, I will get Prof, uh, one, uh, uh, sorry, Prof Tong to answer one question. Uh, um, this is about two questions uh, to Prof Tong. So if you can answer this, Prof. Okay, thank you for the question, uh, Prof YK. Uh, yeah, so gene therapy is a very new technology. Uh, basically, if you have read the literature, uh, basically, it's insertion of a new copy of DNA in the cell so that they can start making the protein uh, or whatever that is missing in the child's body. Uh, and obviously, this is a very new thing. Um, and uh, it's very expensive. Um, and, well, just off the record, we have been uh, treating some of, this, uh, some of this rare neuromuscular disease like spinal muscular atrophy with gene therapy. Uh, in our hospital here for the last two years. Uh, but with any stage, this will, more will come in the near future. But uh, gene editing is a different thing because uh, gene editing means uh, it, it involves uh, changes in the germline. Uh, and, and that is uh, uh, frowned upon because there are a lot of ethical issues. So I hope that I answered that question. 
The second question is from Prof Arifin regarding uh, we have a few gene therapy in UMMC. So as I said, we just have started with one. Uh, there are a few more uh, research in the pipeline. So as Prof Faisal has said, uh, many interesting things are happening. So gene and gene therapy is one of those uh, few that are going to change some of the practice that we're going to have here. Back to you, Faisal. And thank you, uh, Prof. Um, one last comment here uh, to Prof Chu. We really need a wireless bio in OT. Um, Prof, please let us know what is bi wireless bio. <laughs> Thank you for the comment, Prof Aida. Actually, this is really a, a, an indirect ophthalmoscope that is attached without wires. As you can see in the video just now, we have my wires extending from my, my headset. And this new uh, technology also incorporates a recording of what this what the eye doctor is seeing. So all these things obviously need a lot of funding, uh, as well as to maintain all the equipment that we are using to monitor these children's eyes. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Um, what I think I can answer one last question here from Amara Kamara, Prof Amara, I think. Um, what are the crucial challenges in cranial facial, if any? So. Um, I think the challenge is to manage the child from birth and securing the airway, breathing, um, and managing the intracranial pressure, the eye popping out. So it is, it is a challenging to not only to the patient, to the parents, as well as to the team, because um, we have to decide the priority and stage the surgery based on the requirement. Um, and um, I think um, it, is, it is an interesting um, topic when we talk about multidisciplinary. What we want to highlight here as a team is that we have the, um, uh, we have the clinical care, we have the um, research arm, we have the training and education arm, and we are into our second generation of pediatric craniofacial team and there's plenty of um, room for improvement and what we want to do is perhaps in future um, we will uh, formalize a, a team uh, like a center of excellence for pediatric uh, crani craniofacial team because this has involved many um, departments even faculties and um, I think this is one of the uh, way to bring forward this team into the forefront of uh, pediatric craniofacial uh, management in Malaysia. So with that, um, I thank all of you who stay with us for one hour and um, managing all the irritation for all the slides not moving and um, poor voice. And thank you to all my team members and uh, Dr. Tan, uh, Prof. Chu, um, Prof. Daus, Prof. J, uh, Prof. Gan, and Prof. Tong who stay with us here. And not to mention those other teams who, um, team members who are not called in here, they are essential in the team. It's just that um, we have to limit our uh, time today. Right. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye bye.